terms of reference, um, th this is how I, I, this is a useful definition of spirituality for me that the people I work with use and that seems to work okay in the NHS and with Ofsted mm -hmm. and in social services, pl places where this language needs to be used. And it's, it's important to remember that in terms of the British context, um, the Education Act of the last 40 years all have in their f f first two or three sentences an, an assertion that education in England and Wales includes spirituality or the spiritual dimension. It's absolutely up front there in the Education Acts. Um, in the Royal College of Psychiatry, the largest interest group, as you probably know, is the spirituality group. I think they have 5,000 members. And they have a clear uh, working document asserting that good practice includes the spirituality of patients, clients. Um, as you know, the chief nurse um, has recently made very strong assertions about the need for compassion and spirituality in care. So where I'm talking from is not a flaky position. It's from a position that's grounded in mainstream British culture. And one of the reasons why the word spirituality is used in mainstream British culture is it's a typical English compromise between, in p political compromise between the atheists and agnostics who didn't want the religion involved at all, and the religious folk who did want it named, and they used the word spirituality as a middle ground. <coughs> In that context, I am about to plonk in the terms of reference that I will use for this evening. Are you ready? Um, so I want to suggest to you that the, a, a useful way of describing spirituality is that it's everybody's natural connection with the wonder and energy of life. No belief, no projections that there's some thing there doing anything. It's just our natural connection with the wonder and energy of life and the instinct to explore it and understand it. And that, as a term of reference, seems to work at the moment in our culture. And from bishops through to open-minded humanists, there's, there's a, yes, that, that's okay. Connect with the wonder and energy. And then, if, if you want to dig deeper into the terms of reference that I, that I find useful and that we use in the Spiritual Companions Project, we, we suggest that uh, an individual, and, and we extrapolate this suggestion from what all the different spiritual traditions seem to all have in common. We suggest that individuals, people seem to do three things inside a spiritual life with spirituality. They are connect, reflect, serve. I'll just unpack each of them fairly quickly. The, the first one is, if, 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 for instance, in our training we go, what does it look like for you to be able to say to someone, yes, I'm a spiritual companion? What do you mean by spiritual, right? Well, the person would reply, well, one of the things it means is that at least once a day, possibly more often, may, maybe ongoing, I seek to connect with, I take time, and I connect with the wonder and energy of life. Like I focus away from all the stimulation of family, work, cars, television, my health, my happy, all, the, all, the, all those normal concerns, I focus away from them and I, in my own way, connect with the wonder and energy of life. Now, if people want to articulate that or experience it using the language of God or goddess or pagan language, doesn't matter. The, the, the essence is that people are experiencing the wonder and energy. And that's good for people. 
70% of folk, according to the Alistair Hardy Research Foundation, which is the main academic body in this country that researches what are called religious experiences, find that 70% of these experiences happen in landscape and in nature. And a recent study at the LSC called Mappiness, it's an app that you can put on your phone, uh, Mappiness has discovered that when it monitors whether people are feeling happy and at ease, 70% of the times they're feeling happy and at ease is in nature and in landscape. So, so one up to the pagans. And anybody here who ever just gets pleasure sitting in the garden or walking the downs or stroking their cat understands how nature is a <laughs> gateway into something different. And we're not defining it. We're not defining it. We're just saying it's the wonder and energy. What we do do, though, in, in Spiritual Companions is we say for our lot, we need you not just to be noticing it, because as you walk down the street and you notice the blue sky, or you can notice a child whose face touches you, or you can see something that, that opens your heart, touches you, you feel some magic there. We actually ask people to spend some time every day soaking in it. And that means relaxing, centering, grounding, becoming mindful, opening up, surrendering, all, all those kinds of words. But th it's a very kinesthetic, it's an embodied, visceral experience. Connect. And our experience is when I talk to ordinary folk in a pub, I can use that language and I can have that conversation and I can, there are people who have felt connected to the wonder and magic of life since they were very little. It's just there is a background hum in their lives. It's nothing special. It's just always there. Yes, they know life is, has a magic to it. They know that beyond the angst and the horrors of human society and all the strange, terrible things we're capable of doing to each other, in, in the cosmos, in nature, in our hearts, there's something beautiful. There's something benevolent, and it's just humming there in the background. Others don't have that sensation, but occasionally open to it, and they have what's called peak experiences. They're slightly ecstatic experiences. But there's a whole range of different ways of tasting it. And within that context, our definition of a mystic, for example, would be someone who, at some point in their lives, has had this experience and gone, whoo, universe, nature, me, people, pretty bizarre, wonderful. I think I'm going to spend the rest of my life focusing on that. Mm -hmm. that that's even more interesting than sex, and it's even more interesting than being a clever dick intellectual. That's, that's it. So that would be one part of it. That, that would be the connect. The reflect bit would be, in, in terms of spiritual practice, spirituality, the reflect bit would be the assumption, the knowing, the practice, that there's something about us being alive which is a journey, and that as we pass through time, that journey, the spiritual journey, is about heart-opening, mind-opening. It's something to do with more love, more compassion, more wisdom, more enlightenment, more awakening, the m a greater ability to be a centered, grounded, compassionate, witnessing presence who's got a good vibe. And who's more, you know, it's the typical, the more, the more you learn, the, the less you know. The more you, you, the more you're able to surrender to the sheer unknowing and mystery of it. But that requires reflection and it requires quite a disciplined self-honesty, and it requires self-guidance. <clears throat> so what, in therapeutic practice, you know, the, the reflective practice that you guys and girls are supposed to be doing as, as part of your um, clinical development, um, it's, it's precisely the same kind of thing, except this, this would be a, a reflective practice which has been going on for thousands of years within spiritual tra traditions in, in quiet cloisters where people just walk contemplating, God, what a prick I've been today. You know, where, where does that shadow aspect of me emerge? What, and being in dialogue with it and reflecting on it and thinking about it. And at the same time, recognizing they're in, in the context of a benevolent universe, a wondrous universe, even though there's horrors around them. So they're, they're, they're resourced. 
There's no, no, no shame, no guilt tripping, no disappearing into black holes of depression, which will happen sometimes, of course. But it's, so we got connect, reflect. So the, there would be a daily reflective practice, but the daily reflective practice is around the internal topic of, I am moving towards more compassion, more love, more wisdom, more being awake. That's the journey. And it really doesn't matter if I'm ill, it really doesn't matter if I'm healthy. It really doesn't matter whether my relationship is good or not, not good, my business is good or not good, because that, that is my soul's journey. I don't know, I'm not going to try and define the word soul here. And then the third term of reference that we put under the umbrella of spirituality of service, which is that it's very simple. If we are part of this benevolent, wonderful, extraordinary universe, then we need to act and be as if we were part of it. And that means the whole way in which we are interconnected and interrelated to every other living thing in the world requires that we be part of the flow of benevolence, that there must be service. We must be of service. That we have to live a life as best we can that is a bright livelihood that does no harm, that supports, supports other beings, humans, nature, into to fulfilling itself. It's part of the natural flow. And that is not something, you know, I, I'm absolutely sympathetic to, to atheists when they get angry at um, traditional religions for trying to take the high ground with ethics and service. To say, you know, you, as, as if, you know, the, the, the Christians or the Jews or the Muslims or the mosques and the churches and the synagogues have a monopoly on doing service into society because there are many, many NGOs and huge charities that are not uh, based in faith. At the same time, I know that if I were broke and in distress in any city in the world, the first place I would go to would be to a synagogue or a temple or a church because there would be somebody around there that would be prepared to care for me. But there's an added element to spiritual service which would be, and this, this you might find pushing the boundaries too far, but it would be simply that something cooks in meditation and prayer, that there is such a thing as healing, that there's such a thing as a healing resonance. And for people who are not activists and want to be more than just good neighbors, uh, then there's something in meditation and prayer and healing that's of deep service. Um, but the crucial thing is that in, 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 in one's reflective space, you know, that one's reflecting on one's development into compassion and consciousness, and one's also reflecting on how is one of service? How is one of service? All right, so those are my terms of reference. And if I, if I had a whiteboard here, you'd have spirituality, connection with the wonder and energy, wonder and energy, wonder and energy seems to be words that work here. And then you'd have underneath that an instinct to explore it. And then underneath that, you'd have connect, reflect, serve. So those are my terms of reference for spirituality. And then I, for this evening's talk, what's, what's been interesting for me is reflecting on how that then applies to us who are in the um, caring professions. Well, the first one is, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's almost a joke, isn't it? Um, talk therapy is very good for us. It helps us be more present. It helps us understand our own stories. It helps us develop. It helps us be more present to other people. And occasionally, it's good for our clients as well. <laughs> yeah. So there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's a reframe here. There's a reframe here, which, which it's, it's, it's not, this what I'm saying is not so popular with younger counselors and therapists because they're still um, galloping forward to save people. Um, and it's, it's a reframe in, in terms of a spiritual dimension of, of understanding that in, that in actual fact possibly the most important thing that's happening 
in the session is that you are guiding your neuroendocrinal system into being chilled and relaxed and centered and open and loving in the company of someone who might be provocative, doing transference, counter-transference, projection, all that kind of stuff going on, but you stay cool, right? And then you come out of that and you do the same with the fucking teenager who's driving you nuts. <laughs> do you understand what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's the lesson, the, the session, is not framed as I'm being of service to the person. <laughs> the lesson is framed as I'm learning how to be a certain way. Let's see if I can now apply it in those areas of my life where I'm actually an edgy, neurotic, short-fused. Um, these are all I, st I statements, of course. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's, a, but the, there's a reframe there, which is very useful. It's very especially useful for how you go into supervision. You know, what's, hap what's happening with your client is not a problem of your client. The problem is I am moving into, into greater love, into greater wisdom, which is I don't really know anything, and I'm meeting stuff in me. I'm meeting stuff in me. And thank you, clients. Because, I mean, my wife here is sitting behind the camera. I mean, she, she, uh, Sabrina and I can have the most awful row. And the moment someone turns up who needs some care, it's Mr. and Mrs. Nicey Nicey. <laughs> you know, it's just, just like that. Just like that. And all the friends, my friends who are psychotherapists and carers, they, they're all totally not in denial about that. You know, <laughs> oh, it's a client. <laughs> But, but, it's, but, the, but the bizarre thing is, that's not a false action, is it? It's, it's a genuinely real, visceral switch. Mm. Right? But, but my life, my growth has been about, because I, I meditate and I do retreats, blah, blah, blah. My life has been about, can I take w where I'm at in that beautiful, centered, heart open space, can I take that into the difficult relationships, the ones that trigger me, the ones that... Yeah, and without exception, the stuff that's triggering me is stuff from my childhood that I need to go deeper into, blah, blah, blah. Right? But as a, as, a, as a therapist or carer, I'm then looking for where am I getting my support? And what I'm suggesting is, it, from the spiritual dimension, what's useful is, if you accept the paradigm I'm suggesting, is that as a carer, f lest you burn out, lest you take things too seriously and become Ernest Ernie, you must spend regular time doing whatever it is that works for you that connects you with the wonder and energy. And the great thing about modern spirituality, it doesn't tell you what to do. It, it tells you, go for wonder and energy, but we don't care how, how you do it. If it's music or dance or prayer or meditation or healing or looking after your grandchildren or changing nappies or cooking or being on a motorbike or whatever it is that connects you, do it. Do it, do it, do it, but do it knowing that it's good for you. It's not mindless, it's mindful. Wouldn't it be wonderful if, if, if we, you know, God, God, head teachers, I don't know if it's still there, head teachers, 10 years ago, Ofsted legislated for head teachers that they had to have half an hour's reflection every week, reflective time every week, half an hour. Um, I was hand-holding one head, and the only time he could do it was um, tinkering with his car in the garage. He was a, liked old cars, and it was when he was doing mechanics that his, he, he could go into the zone that would allow him to be calm enough to. But can you imagine a culture where carers, teachers, educators, therapists, medics, HR people, managers, leaders, they understood that a civilized day that fuels you includes making sure you connect. It's, 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 it's not narcissistic. It's not narcissistic. It, it, it feeds you, which then spills over to your colleagues and family. It also changes, you know, the, the, the reflective pra practice for carers, therapists changes in, into this. It's, it's not actually, it, Carl Rogers was right. You know, it's, it's not the method. It, it's, at one level, it's not the method. It's, it, it is, the, it's presence. It's, you know, he, he clothed it in, in a language of unconditional positive regard, 
etc. But in actual fact, you know, dig deeper into the writings, there's an absolute understanding of grounded presence, grounded presence, 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 presence. And the story I often tell is about Gerda Boysen, the Norwegian body psychotherapist, who when she first came to Britain had a queue of clients wanting to see her. And she couldn't speak English well enough. And she was, she was driving, she drove her first two or three clients nuts. By saying, what did you say? Say that again, please. And the clients were like, ah. And she, so she decided, she was a body psychotherapist. She, went, oh, there's something, she decided she'd pretend she understood. So she, 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 she just, so she just said, pretend she understood. She'd just sink into her body. And every night just going, hmm, yes. Mm. She had a client, she started opening up like that. And her English got better, and she, find, she caught up with the stories they were telling her. <laughs> And I th the most interesting thing for me sometimes when I look with groups and one to one is I th I th I think sometimes that I'm a the role of the counselor professional is to be an ambassador and a conduit for the wonder and energy. There's a reassurance, you know, you're not on your own. There is a world bigger than your problems. Um, that there's something useful and magical happening there. Do you remember that very bizarre video of Ronnie, Adi Lang with one of his clients? Do you remember Ronnie Lang? Nutter. Um, <laughs> I knew one of his colleagues, David Cooper. Did you ever meet David Cooper? He was also in the anti-psychiatry room. A friend of mine went to David Cooper for a session one morning. This was London, 1970 or 69. A friend of mine went for a, for a psychoanalytic session with David Cooper one morning, and David Cooper said, what are you doing for the rest of the day? And my friend said nothing. And David Cooper said, I'm going to take some acid. You will look fancy looking after me. <laughs> anyway. Times have moved on, haven't they? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so why, why did I tell that story? Just to. Uh, I was, yeah, anyway. Ardy Lang. Mm, Ardy Lang, yes. It was, it, was, it, was, it was Lang, thank you. In the video, Lang, it, it's, uh, yeah, he, he, this guy comes in, he's hugely depressed, and Lang just starts joshing with him. Joshing, joshing, joshing. Cracking jokes, the guy starts laughing, ha 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 ha. 45 minutes later, you know, they're having a banter together like they're in a pub, you know. And Lang says, session's over. And the guy says, what, what session? <laughs> and Lang says, you're laughing. <laughs> Can't be depressed, you're laughing. <laughs> yeah, come back if you want more. <laughs> So I, th I think that I just think there's something about if if if, if it's like yeah it's coming out of the earnest earliness of being the therapist you know oh. and recognizing that you're you're you are an ambassador for the flow there's something in there that's useful for counselors therapists to reflect on I think and then there's the then there's the cl the, cl the client. And again, I, I, from this perspective, in the first place, the spiritual perspective says the person who is presenting problems is actually a soul on a journey moving towards being compassionate, awake, and loving. And I'm here in some way or another to enable that. And I think in that respect, Lang's mischievous, maybe even drunken joshing had had a had a homeopathic dose of something crucial, actually, um, because I th think ultimately our job is to enable autonomous self-managing adults 
I think that's ultimately where we want our people to go to. Now it's very difficult in the NHS if you're presented with someone who's in deep depression and <sighs> appearing to have delusions and stuff. Um, so I'm, I know that this, this is an area where I'm wrestling. And it's, and it's an area where how you view, view the client and how you view the methodology you use with your client is, is it's a moving target. So th I'll, I'll just lay out where I, I, the, the stakes I've put down in the ground for me to try and understand where I'm supposed to be in this, how I am with my client, my groups. And at one end, I've got something very simple, which is an, an instinct to relieve suffering. And at the other end, I've got, wake up. It's time to give you a kick in the ass. And my favorite profess professor of nursing, Margaret Newman, who's, who's uh, retired now, was an American professor of nursing. She, she trained her nurses, used to say to her nurses, she, she'd say, look, your patients are going from birth to death. And in between birth and death, they do illness, wellness, illness, wellness, illness, wellness, illness, wellness. And your real job as a nurse is to birth their consciousness. Midwife their consciousness. Wake them up. Wake them up. Now this is very troublesome. Because if I've got someone who's having trouble with their relationship, I have to make a discreet judgment call, don't I, between now, this is, this, I have more license to do this because I'm in, I'm in spiritual companionship. I'm not in the therapy world. I'm, I'm in the world of the soul's journey is about more heart, more consciousness. So my world, I can say to this person who's suffering in her relationship, get off your story. Just get off it. It's, it's neither here nor there in actual fact. Wake up, wake up. All this is about is an internal struggle in you to become more loving, more awake. And it may require that you do deep psychotherapeutic, deep psychodynamic work or whatever, but wake up. Or um, let them tell their story, let them tell their story, let them tell their story. And, and in my body, I was talking, because I had a group over the weekend, and afterwards I was reflecting with my helper whether I was too impatient. Am I too impatient? Like, cause, because, and I'm, I'm reflecting, am I too impatient? Or is, is, is my impatience uh, just me taking some kind of revenge, infantile revenge, you know, because I didn't get enough attention when I was little, therefore I want somebody to wake up and then they'll be the way I want them to be, you know. That's what most of us do in therapy, isn't it? We want, we want our clients to be the way we want them to be so we feel okay about them. Right? Uh, you know, that disarming insight in Alice Miller, which I keep coming back to for therapists and group leaders, which is all we're trying to do is, with our clients is recreate what we wanted when we were children. You know? And we give our clients gestures of approval when they behave the way that makes us feel good. And our clients then start to behave in the ways that make us feel good. And all we do is perpetuate self-pleasure at the expense of our clients' development. Anyway. <coughs> it's fantastic insight, isn't it? Alice Miller, drama of gifted child, classic, just oh, killer, killer insight. Um, but for me, I'm, I'm wrestling with, I'm wrestling with this business of relief, suffering. Okay, existential pain, trauma. If it's trauma, if somebody's in trauma, I absolutely know that's not right to wake them up. They need to come out of the trauma into a pay, place of self-management. 
Okay, so not while they're in trauma. All right, so that they're not in trauma, they're just in distress. They're just not happy. They're just whatever it is. As, as, a, as, a, as a, the old-fashioned word was spiritual director, as, as a spiritual director, well, horrible phrase, isn't it? Um, when is it right for me to tease out that business of no, and, and you're not actually suffering, you're not actually having an existential crisis, you've just been completely conned by bourgeois materialism. Or, you know, you, you've just been completely conned by rom romantic ideals of what relationships should be like, or what your breasts should be like, or what your penis should be like. They're not, they're, it's not you've just been completely conned by these videos. Just stop it, stop it, wake up. Get off it. <laughs> Get, you know. And equally, I find I, d d d d I have to do that with people in their 50s, 60s. The number of people I know in their 70s, you're still yearning for the perfect relationship. <laughs> and not... You comfort me. <laughs> <laughs> giving each other a little stroke. <laughs> yeah, but, 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 and, and not, and these, I'm talking about people like people, th therapists, trained therapists, carers, right? Wise, educated, and not able to say in the moment, oh, I'm having an experience of a mammalian creature urge to have flesh close to me in some presence and some company. There's not even that level of watchfulness to it. It's just completely lost in the story. Completely lost in the story. Now, when, what, is, what's, what am I supposed to be doing? Am I supposed to be listening? And is that colluding or not colluding? Or am I supposed to be saying, wake, wake up? Or am I supposed to be saying, why don't, you try, why don't you try a bit of mindfulness instead of sex? Ha uh ha, -huh. sorry. Have I lost, I've lost some of you. <laughs> so, here you have what I hope you can see is someone wrestling with the issues in a way that, that I hope you can see. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> I, un I understand. <laughs> I said the triggering words, didn't I? <laughs> Which came out of your tummy. It's very, very basic, isn't it? <laughs> so what I'm hoping you can see is I come out of what was called New Age culture. Awful phrase. People hated it because of all the associations with it. I come out of a holistic approach to spirituality. I come out of a smorgasbord approach to spirituality. I come out of a supermarket approach to spirituality. But there's an assumption that somehow or other inside all that, I have lost my robust, self-reflective, self-critical honesty, which is not the case. I'm, I am on it, inside me, on myself. So I partly say that to you as fellow carers fellow talkers, talk therapists, listeners, to reassure you that the, the, it's not just now, but historically there was a huge tradition inside spirituality of robust self-reflection and robust questioning about core issues. What is creation. And there was not a, an unthinking 
fundamentalist approach. So, let me just look at my notes. I would love to take a minute's quiet just to let what we've said so far settle. Thank you. I think it's probably time for a cup of tea. And then we can have a conversation afterwards if you want.